Can you hear me? Aloha, everybody. <laughs> it's so good to see you. Yay. So good to, Yay. this is such a good thing to do every Sunday. Yay. Sister Maria. Ah, oh. hi. <laughs> So, you know, take your time to kind of see each other. This is our <laughs> beloved Sangha and um, really important. It's the imp most important uh, part of my life. Hmm. So I hope you all are well, had a good week. <laughs> I think we'll... Steve, do you want to say hi before I start? Aloha, everyone. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> and Amanda is helping us today. Thank you, Amanda. Hi, everyone. <laughs> From <laughs> south of Portland. <laughs> Let's see. It's so good to see you, Michelle. For me, I think I saw you so long ago and living on this oh. part of the island, I don't get there. Uh-huh. Well, good to see. We're not even, where are you? Maybe I'll be back. Oh, here. <laughs> Leslie. Yeah hi. yeah, hi, Leslie. Good to see you. Okay, so um, sitting together feels so important and um, just asking you to notice your sitting posture. Let the attention just kind of gently settle inside your body the space around your body. And simply knowing, knowing that you're sitting. The reminder to set an intention to bring a quiet abiding and carefulness, that kind of sacred care, gentleness, kindness to whatever appears, even to the resistance if you're having resistance to anything, just to remember you can bring a, a caring, quiet connection. And we're, we're going to start with remembrance, the like the fulfillment of remembrance. Uh, so right now, it's, it's like you're remembering that hearing is happening all the time. And you can focus on knowing, knowing just very quietly abiding with knowing that hearing is happening. Let the vibration and textures of silence and sound You can also remember to be careful of Letting the thought 
the thoughts about the sounds become predominant. So giving the vibration and textures that are happening right in the moment. Airtime, space, breathing room, so that the sounds are appearing directly through the ear door, not just through the thought process. And a lot of this is just checking to see, check to see. Of course, thinking thoughts about the experience will happen, but remembering to come back to the direct experience, receiving the sounds just as they're happening, if you can. Noticing them appear and disappear or just disappear. Knowing, remembering that seeing is happening with our eyes closed. Light and shadow. Knowing, seeing is happening. And notice how that can bring your attention deeper inside. We don't have to be pulled out by any visual imagery, just the soft awareness of sensations at your eyes. Sometimes there can be tightness there behind your eyes. from trying too hard. Knowing, smelling, tasting, remembering they're happening all the time. And then this orchestra, music of aliveness, your whole body. Seeing if you can notice that relief, that ease. Of not trying to get anything or get rid of anything. Letting your body sensations be just as they are. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Letting the attention go wherever it's naturally drawn, anywhere in your body. textures, vibrations, and the word eye or hand or hip, they're just words, pain, pleasure, they're just words for moment by moment changing textures, weather. It's like weather changing moment by moment.
not having to take the weather so personally, sensations in our body so personally, although we do at times, just noticing that. And at times during the sitting, of course, letting the attention settle in with your hands. The sensations there. And from there to the movement of the breath at your belly, abdomen. You can put your hand there at times or hands and just let that movement of life that we call breath, that we depend on so completely. Notice it come and go just as it is. Receiving it, if you can, as it's happening, right with the movement. We can learn so much about wanting to control how things are through how we relate to this movement. So just as with happiness or fear, or compassion, anger, shame, doubt, sleepiness, boredom, sadness, kindness, just like the breath, we might think it should be a little more deep, less shallow, less tight, more smooth long, short, warm, cool. Rather than being interested in it just as it is. We learn through being aware of sounds and body sensations and breath. This relationship of kindness, care, gentleness, connecting but not controlling. Same with anything that appears in the heart, the mind, the body. Feeling that deep relief. We don't have to be perfectionistic. be motivated out of fear or grief. 
version. But motivated to connect with life just as it is.
Thanks, Michelle. I've been thinking about uncertainty and reassurance. What is a what is a protection? We've been taught uh, various protection meditations, uh, including the Brahma Viharas, uh, mindfulness itself, of course. It seems we can use all of them in, in these days, in these times of, of uncertainty. Um, even if our own situation is relatively stable and protected, we know that that's not the condition uh, in the world, maybe even close to us in other areas of near where we live and certainly other places on the planet, their vulnerability to pretty radical uncertainty and, and lack of any kind of reassurance or, or protection. And what about the energy? What about the courageous energy required um, to adapt and, and meet the unknown, all the unknowns that arise every day are as a pall over us all um, this past year. And we don't know how far into the future that courageous energy that's part of the awakening factors, virya, the energy of a lion or lioness uh, that is required to meet what is, not what we might want, but exactly what's happening in and around us um, at this moment or moment to moment. Are we able to call up and cultivate this virya, this virya energy? Generally, it follows along from the investigation of phenomena when we turn our attention uh, inward and rest, abide on the senses of themselves. What we see here, sense in the body, and imagine or know in the mind, in the thought realm. Um, that kind of discernment to know what is, what is the thing, what is the seeing, and what is the hearing, uh, the smelling, tasting, uh, sensing through the body, and knowing of the mind. What is it without the story we build around it, around ourselves, the personalization of that, the self-referencing of what we see, hear, sense, and, and know with the mind. So that takes great courage. Already we're needing that great courage, as well as when that discernment, when those discernment moments are there, and, and we know the experience of our just being without the add-on of the personalization and identification when it is just seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking, that the freedom or the openness, the wideness of the mind, the depth of the heart that occurs, therein we find that virya, that energy of the lion or lioness, the courageous energy, uh, that in practice we use to delve deeper into 
into the phenomenology of our experience moment to moment uh, to see what's there on the deeper levels and realms of the mind what is still there needing to be washed up you know what what formations of excessive attachment and ill will anger uh, and deluded mind what what remains to be cleansed through our practices of mindfulness, loving kindness, uh, compassion, joy, equanimity. Let alone also the courage to manifest the, the, pra the practice uh, externally, not just when we do our formal practice and turn awareness in through, upon our senses and abide in the in the knowing and the unfolding as the phenomena reveals itself and that discerning awareness can see what's helpful what's unhelpful what's skillful what's unskillful what is the correct path that we should take what's the right speech i should use in this situation you know what can i do that will enact uh, liberation for myself or for others around me? What activities can make a difference? Uh, and ultimately, that the, the tipping point of all, you know, where, where is our intention in this moment? What is the intention behind our thinking process, behind the speech that we're about to utter? And where is the intention behind our actions? And what we're manifesting in the world, especially at this time. Uh, are we aware of the difference it can make our intentional acts of generosity, intentional acts of uh, metta, unconditional loving kindness, care, compassion, joy? Are we aware, are, are we aware of the potency that's part of this um, discernment or this investigation of phenomena is the realization of uh, the potency, the power of intention. When, we're, when, we, when we give anything with awareness of the intention, we bring the wisdom to it that makes it the most powerful kind of generosity um, there is. And when we, when we think kind thoughts or speak kind words or enact kind physical actions with the awareness that the intention is there, we see the wisdom of that. We see how the wisdom empowers that to the highest kind of kindness of metta, the purest kind of loving kindness, the kind that liberates the kind that liberates our own heart and the kind that uh, can move mountains, can change people, not by our wish, not by our, our trying to fix things or convince anything, but by the mere abiding in the awareness of that kindness with wisdom, that compassion with wisdom, that generosity with the wisdom that understands the power of that generosity because of intention. Of course, we, we all feel afraid at times or sad or angry uh, or hurt. Uh, and those emotions come up there. They are dhammas too. They are phenomena to be known and to be understood without which we get we get sick, physically sick, emotionally sick, mentally sick. Usually underlying um, a pain like that of anger, or ill will, sadness, feeling hurt. And uh, the, the papancha mind that, that it takes us into, that is the fabrications uh, and all the antics of the stories that we create that this person did that or 
if this situation weren't there, I wouldn't feel this way or that wouldn't happen. Um, even if there be truth in, in, in those mental machinations and imaginations and narrative, still the reality is there that uh, some pain, some hurt, uh, some condition caused the sadness. Uh, and the only real remedy is to directly feel that emotion. I find it most helpful and generally we teach going to the body, trusting the intelligence of the body in, in discovering and abiding in the awareness of the sensation that correlates with that hurt, that sadness, that anger, that fear. If we can feel the sensations, then through the sensations, through the physicality of that, that correlates with the painful emotion, the difficult emotion, we feel the emotion. So recently I, I was feeling really vulnerable to the change and uncertainty. And it was sort of consuming, like the whole front of my body felt raw. Like I, I wanted to put more clothes on, even though I had clothes on and it's, it's hot here in Hawaii. But I just wanted to wrap myself and, and feel that comfort and pressure of, of, of cloth, you know. Uh, a hug would have done, but there's nobody here <laughs> to hug. And I don't have my teddy bear. It's stored someplace in <laughs> another house. Um, so what I do is just, I take a posture. It doesn't matter what posture. You can sit just like here or uh, can stand sometimes, it's really interesting to change from our normal habitual, habitual posture uh, that we relate to as our meditation posture, because all four, remember, are sacred meditative postures. So it really doesn't matter, we might change them up, especially if one isn't working. So in this case, I was, I was, going between sitting and, and lying meditation uh, in such a way that I would be feel awake. I would feel the posture ref, reflected uprightness of mind. Uh, so then there was no filter in the silent stream of awareness. It's just that, that sacred pre-verbal, pre-conceptual, silent stream of awareness. And I, I could feel these raw areas, these raw and tender vulnerable areas as, as sensations that felt exposed, like the body when it's exposed to um, an element to, to cold air or to raw conditions, whatever they may be environmentally to make the body feel uh, like it needs to pull back or cover up or be held. And I felt those, those sensations. In some cases, it felt like the skin had been rubbed raw, viscerally, that kind of rawness. In other areas, it just felt like it kind of was smarting, wanting to, to pull back cave in on itself. In other areas, it just felt like a, a tingling, but, but not that soft, warm sensation of tingling uh, that feels like, you know, goosebumps or like those nice chills that go up the spine sometimes when we're meditating and concentrated and whatnot. It just felt all like related to emotion of vulnerability and emotion of uncertainty, emotion of, of fear or trepidation, of helplessness in the face of uncertainty. Uh, and so I, I, I did my, with the discerning awareness and courageous energy and curiosity, I kept the and concentration, 
I kept the narrative at bay. I, I tried to keep any story from coming in and just stayed with the skin sensation or flesh sensations as, as deep as it would go, just the grounding, the mindfulness anchoring in the body and then through the body sensations aware of these areas that are were connected to vulnerable emotion vulnerable feelings uncertainty um, rawness and, and gradually there was a calming the the sensations themselves and the emotions didn't just disappear. They were still arising, existing and vanishing. But there was a stabilization of the system, the internal system that is able to observe and able to see and to feel and to know what's happening. And so all around, so it's my, as if my body and heart expanded to hold those difficult feelings of uncertainty and fear uh, and vulnerability and just be with it oh, as, as if as if part of my mind were saying it's, it's okay it's just this it is just this right now happening and in the in, in that way, the very uncertainties uh, move to uh, um, the fact of them, the reality of them, and the relationship of awareness and discernment, the wisdom element of awareness, brought about a, a reassurance. It was like a meta blanket or a compassion uh, cloth put around. I just felt reassured and, and felt more clearly the, the courage, that energy called courageous energy to adapt and to meet exactly what's there. Yes, thoughts would flip in and out, you know, thoughts concerning a lot of the uncertainty, a lot of a lot to do with the pandemic that we're going through and the suffering and conditions that come about from it. You know, that one thing affects another, affects another, you know, and there's a whole rubric of conditionality in which like it starts to seem over really overwhelming and confusing and complex, you know, all the complications that come about uh, from this from this illness and its capacity to virtually shut down the world as we know it. So I, I felt then that my protection in that moment was coming from a composure, not, want, not, a, not a forced one, not strained, not enacted, not pretentious, but actually an innate character of our heart that we learn is a, a fruit of our deepening practice, that composure is there. When we take a few deep breaths at the beginning of a meditation, and if that leads into a steady rhythmic breathing process that we don't interfere with, that we don't, we don't force, we don't stop, we don't control in any way, and so that the breath just does its thing of enlivening every cell, every molecule of the body, bringing oxygen to the brain. And, and the, the pure observing awareness of that breath and its, its effect in the body uh, begins to bring about a calming of the bodily formations. E even if there's eruptions, say, from that hurt, that anger, that vulnerability, even if those qualities are still there, still all the other parts of the body feel like they're settling. 
that they're coming into a, a composure that's able to hold the raw and, and vulnerable areas. And then also with the mind, even more importantly, because the calming of mental formations is, is our strength and our resource for our whole system being able to hold what is uh, without collapsing in on itself or losing its sense of composure and then being even more vulnerable to difficult emotions and to changing conditions uh, so that we we build up even more of a sort of doomsday mentality whether it's a small personal doomsday or the larger picture on the planet this characteristic of the heart we don't have to construct it it's something already there as we breathe and relax and be aware of whatever conditions even if they're difficult emotions that we're feeling quite raw you know it's really not true to say well i can't meditate right now i'm i'm, I'm hurting too much I'm too afraid, I'm too raw, I'm too vulnerable. Yet yeah, feels like that sometimes. And yes, it is even um, skillful sometimes to take a few steps back and not feel like we're forcing ourselves, you know, into a, a meditative um, procedure. But, but, but eventually, if we follow that, if we do take a few steps back, if we do give room, however we do it, if we Aikido, the, the condition of that difficult emotion, say it's fear or vulnerability, uh, and step back, you know, look around, look in nature, drink some juice, you know, do something, not feel that we have to med meditate. Uh, and, and then just let mindfulness slip in, you know, like a, like a spy, this lets, let it slip in, this be inviting of that, that silent, uh, non-harming quality of awareness that has no agenda, that doesn't want to fix anything or change anything. That's only job is to show up and be present for what exactly is there. And, and the benefits of that is that it attracts other associated skillful states. So it, start, it brings up the courage, it brings up the loving kindness and the caring compassion and the curiosity uh, and the ever needed equanimity that starts to bring composure and calm mental and physical formations of the body. It just kind of sneaks in there because of our practice and, and because we're, we're not fighting anything, we're sort of saying, okay, to, to whatever, okay, I can't meditate. Okay, so I won't meditate. What now? <laughs> um, what we learn from this protective composure, this characteristic innately embedded in our hearts um, is that the mind by its nature dwells naturally in the in the four establishments of mindfulness in our ancestral home there's no other there's no other place for it to go because the four domains are our pastures of our, of our ancestral home make up the totality of our experience, our body, our feelings, our, our mind, our, our knowing, consciousness, and all the other phenomena they experience, all the emotions and, and thoughts 
and, and sense experience, sights, colors, sound, vibrations, fragrances, and flavors, and sensations, textures, and all the creative imagery of the mind uh, and emotions. That's it. That's our ancestral home. And that's the more we get to know it, the, the more we feel that innate uh, positioned composure is, is indeed already there and already able to, all right, what, what can be felt now in the pasture of the body, bodily sensations, either in its form of posture or changing posture or movement or the elemental nature of earth characteristic of textures, water characteristic of cohesion or fluidity and, and fire characteristic of heat and warmth, and coolness and cold and the air characteristic of support, firmness, um, as well as movement, vibration, oscillation. There it is. That's, that's all of what we call the body. And so if we set aside all the other um, papancha information about our body, our head, our hand, our feet, and so forth, then it is just this present time experience. The, the Buddha uh, was, was um, asked a question by his cousin, and the atten his attendant, the last 25 years of his life, Ananda. Uh, and the Buddha, often called the Tathagata, Tathagata means thus gone, meaning he's gone beyond the polarity of life and death, of gone beyond uh, personality to the transpersonal, beyond the arising and passing, beyond the the fiction of opposites so the scan the the, the, the tagada he's ananda asks a question about what he experiences and the buddha responded well feelings are known as they arise and feelings are known as they are present and feelings are known as they disappear. And then he said the same thing about perceptions. Often when, it's, when our system is articulated, it's articulated as this physical form, feelings, perceptions, intentional states and consciousness. It's another way to describe our body. So then he chose perceptions are known as they arise, perceptions are known as they are present, like right now, here and now, the only time they can be known by mindfulness. And feelings are known as they disappear, that is in their moment of vanishing, not after they've disappeared. So he said that about feelings, he said that about perceptions, perceiving, colors and forms, <clears throat> people and so forth. And he said it about intentional thoughts. Intentional thoughts are known as they arise, as they are present and as they disappear. Remember this too, Ananda, as a wonderful and marvelous quality. It's a very simple distillation of our practice. Just, just to sit back or walk with a sense of relaxation, aware the physical form of feelings, of perceptions, our intentional thoughts, be known as they arise in the moment of their presence or existence, and as they vanish, as they disappear. Remember this too, Ananda, as a wonderful, and marvelous quality of our Dhamma, of our Dhamma practice for practice of the truth.
I, I spoke once before of uh, Gotama, the Buddha to be in his young years in the palace and how Chana, the charioteer, would take him out and how he came across the four great events of seeing someone aging, someone ill, someone dead, and then an ascetic more peaceful than peace itself. And how that motivated Gotama to the great renunciation. <clears throat> and it was Chana, the charioteer, who took him with um, um, his favorite horse, Katanaka, to the river where he shaved his head, where Gotama shaved his head, and then went off in his renunciation. He, the Buddha, the Gotama was 29 then, and he became the Buddha at 35. And Chana, at that time, ordained uh, when the Buddha came back to his home and met his father and his uh, mother-in-law ordained and his son ordained. And at that time, Chana, the charioteer, also ordained and stayed with the Sangha for the 45 years of the Buddha's um, teachings, travels and teachings. However, it was really difficult with Chana because he had been the charioteer and known uh, the Buddha as Gotama before he became Buddha, he was really overbearing and he, he criticized a lot the chief disciples, the two chief uh, nun disciples and the two chief uh, monk disciples. Uh, we hear a lot of Sariputta, Moggallana. Uh, and it just went on and on. The Buddha was patient all the way up to the point of just before the Buddha, uh, the Buddha's passing, he pronounced uh, a, a Brahmadana, a Brahmadanda. A Brahmadanda is a banishment because Chana wouldn't improve his behavior. And so Chana was banished and no one would talk to him. It's the equivalent in, in, in the Buddhist world of uh, like a uh, like being killed. You just stop talking to a Sangha person. And it's the same as if they were, you know, hung or shot or put in the electric chair or whatever. It's, it's, it's equivalent. So that eventually there's nothing for Chana to do and he went off on his own for a long time. Eventually, Ananda, the attendant of the Buddha, who then was fully awakened, uh, went to visit Chana. And talked him into coming back into the fold and gave him instructions for practice. And Chana, it was like a stone moved away from his heart and he had a, a change of heart and he did practice and he did become fully enlightened, fully awakened. The charioteer from the childhood time of the Buddha. To close, um, that calm and quiet place inside. When I was taking care of my dad the last eight months of his life, I often would stay at my mom and dad's house because uh, he would get up in the middle of the night and need help or need medicine or be confused. And so I heard him one night up and I had had a little candle in his room and I, I escorted him back and put him in bed and rubbed his feet for a while. And my dad was kind of noticing how the room was softly lit by candlelight. And it was like, there was a, a trade wind breeze outside and a very quiet, sacred feeling. And my dad himself was very calm and at ease within himself. And he, 
he just said, he just said one thing to me in the form of a question. He said, is this, is this what the next place is going to be like? I said, yes, dad. Oh, he said, and he leaned back and fell back to sleep. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We have some time for Q&A. Um, if you have a question, if you go to the um, participants button, I think, is where the hand raise is, and I can help you unmute your microphone. Quinn, are you wanting to ask a question? I'm trying to unmute. There we go. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, Steve, uh, the, the word that you use, uncertainty, is probably the aptest word for our time now and um, sometimes I feel so bombarded by all the events around me and also in personal life that um, I think mindfulness or Brahma Viharas can't, can't bring me any relief. I, I just had to cover myself and run away. Is there any other suggestion? I'm, I'm wondering in your life as a physician, how many times you're up against uncertainty with a patient who sometimes you didn't know what the outcome would be. And maybe sometimes they died and maybe sometimes they did not. But I'm wondering if you can pull from your own life an example where so, sometimes it was really overwhelming and you, you had to take some recourse. At other times, you just learned to feel trust and somehow reassured yourself and kept some composure. And, and they actually did not die, survived. I'm just wondering from your own life. Yes, a lot, of time, a lot of time, constantly, every minute, there's, there was uncertainty, uh, there was anxiety, there was mm. doubts about my skills, mm. 
there was lots of sleep mm. many times. And mm. the only recourse I had was maybe just abiding in that. Mm -hmm. Just accept that I have no control over it. Mm -hmm. That would be my recourse. You were fortunate to, to have the Dhamma for most of your, your practice as a physician in your life, as well as as a parent and a partner. You always had it there. You, you had those recourses there. So it's natural that sometimes the strength is there, the energy is there to sustain them. And at other times, the energy might not be there. You know, if you're on for 36 hours and you, it's just a lot going on at the hospital or with your patients and, and your energy would run low, that uh, it would increase the anxiety and it would be much more difficult for, for you to handle. You just want to go home and sleep. Yeah, I feel the same way <laughs> these days. Yeah. Oh, can you speak up, Michelle, or put, put your it's thing my, up? My, yeah, sorry. My microphone. Um, I think sometimes it's more that, that we're not applying that acceptance to what's happening in the moment, you know, so that that unconditional acceptance, if we're feeling like, um, we can't handle it anymore. That, that, that turning that acceptance to not being able to handle accepting it anymore, I think sometimes we forget that part, that, that, the, that the equanimity, that that strength includes feeling like we don't have any more strength. And, and I, I do think that that's kind of like one could anticipate some years ago that we would be here at this time. It's like you could anticipate from all the causes and conditions that, that we would actually be here at this point in time where there'd be times when we wouldn't feel like we had the spiritual strength to go on, that that's, that's how you develop more strength is by facing that you don't have any more and that it's okay and that it's okay to get under the covers and pull the covers over that that that's a that's of course we do that sometimes because it it just gets to be too much it's like i think that that feeling of oh it's just too much it's becoming more frequent for so many people and that that, that if you feel like that feeling is not okay, that it feels like too much, that's when we get in trouble. And so the work tends to be kind of like not what we're used to, which is we're used to having maybe that doubt or that, that feeling come up and we might feel like there's something that works like metta or compassion or, you know, we'll, we'll pull something out and it works, works meaning what? That we can connect with the experience and, and be okay with it. That's the equanimity is really just meeting what's there, which is this is too much, now what? Now what to do? And that it's okay. We've been talking about that moving away from something skillfully is not a defeat. It's not and being a... Pardon? It's not being a coward. No, and that's what that's that's the conditioning. The conditioning for us is to think that that's cowardice versus courage. It's courage. It takes great strength to do that with awareness. Yeah, because it's like a, it, it's humbling. <laughs> we don't like being that humble that we hit a place where we actually can't do it. It's like, whoa. And it's so good because that's the ultimate loss of control, right? That, okay, surrender, uh, time for a break. You know, it's like uh, rest. Rest brings energy to have courage again. And to, no, to not have the courageous energy is part of the cycle of um, if you care, if you care right now, 
you know, it, it's just like, it brings tears to the eyes, you know, to care right now and to know um, how high the stakes are and to um, do the best we can in, in every way. Um, to be helpful and to take care of, of, of everything in ourselves. It's like, this is a, a great time to be practicing as we keep saying, <laughs> there's nothing like it. Thank you. It's a good question, yeah. Kay, do you have a question? Leslie? Kay, oh, Kay sorry, had his hand Kay. up. Yeah, okay, Kay, yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, um, I, I came to take much refuge in the practice this year because of the uncertainty. And I appreciate that more and more. And because I think I care more about it. Um, because of the schoolwork I being involved in, I'm, I'm facing a lot of, um, clinical research of this practice and it's it's hard to it makes me cringe when I see those conclusions and the percentage and statics because it's clearly not what I what they present as mindfulness is not clearly in that research and they just take the positive part and it just doesn't include the degree of joys and sorrows and all the and just it make yeah it just i don't know the frustration and i think it just comes as we go through this uncertain time and mental health and I understand that more and more people are trying to find some kind of refuge and and yet it just I I just don't know and I'm just taken aback and this is what it is and I'm just trying to see um what will unfold and at the same time I uh, my heart is just, I can just feel my heart tightening uh, every research and um, research paper I had to read. And it just, <laughs> I don't know if there's anything that you two could say um, around those things that would be helpful. It makes perfect sense, Kay, that you would go, go through that. You've been practicing for many years now, and um, you've made your practice your life. And so other things that you do for your vocation or your calling and your studies and whatnot, um, I understand that sometimes that might feel intrusive if they don't in their, in their body of information are in that teaching modality. It doesn't have the same expansiveness or the same skills to be able to, to move as, as you can move when you're purely in a practice mode. But that's part of who you are now. You know, you, you've done retreats with us all over the world. You, you were a monk last year. And, uh, you know, now you're, you're right in the middle of it one of the largest cities in the world and you're in the, and your your training in your vocation and you're continuing your practice. So I think, I think you're doing a really good job. And yes, as Michelle says, sometimes our energy is just, just going to drop away and we, we can't see it as a failure. We, we can't see it as, you know, it's, it's not, giving up to get to take a couple of steps back and get the rest we need or to, you know, or call a spiritual friend or do one of the many things you know to do now 
to reconnect with a deeper sense of your being. Thank you, Steve. Some of this is trusting your own wisdom, okay, right? Like, and that the aversion is, um, a di it's really seeing it as a disagreement, that it's okay to disagree and um, have aversion to something that feels untrue. Um, a healthy aversion. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fine. It's like... Uh, really understanding that we're not trying to get rid of pain. <laughs> really getting that the motivation in this practice is not getting rid of pain. And like, and that, that a lot of these papers will be holding up a carrot, that if you do this and this and this, then you're not going to have any aversion, right? And you're sitting there with all this aversion <laughs> and you've been practicing longer, right? It's a bad joke, you know? And that like, it's like really, you got to have some you know, understanding that that's what happens with this stuff that, you know, you, you understand that it's not that, but then <laughs> you end up looking like the person that is less wise because you're so angry about it. It's pretty good. <laughs> okay. I, I will go through it. I think yeah. I have. Yeah. <laughs> you got to keep going through it. Yeah. <laughs> Leslie, you have a question? Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, well, this is a wonderful um, for me to hear you all. <clears throat> and um, I, I'm an artist, and I have similar blocks of what you all been talking about. Um, feeling uh, it, it's a time I want to express, but also feeling um, blocked. Mm -hmm. And something you said, Steve in your talk um, to meet the moment ring uh, important to me to pay attention to that in uh, I think Michelle you also said something or everybody was saying uh, it's okay at these times to relax to I feel all this response you know as a person um, in these times um, I, I want to act. I don't feel it's time for me to not act. And so part of acting for me is, is participate doing an image or doing an art. There are several uh, shows now that are coming up in the time of COVID-19. And I, I, I feel like art is, is such a wonderful transformational element, but I, at the same time, I don't know, I'm, I guess I'm similar to some of you that I feel uh, that that juice of creating <laughs> is, uh, is hard right now for me. But I, I'm going to take some of the uh, ideas from this talk, I think will help to meet the moment. And um, not change that moment and I think in that uh, you know that that you can say that but there is transformation and all I know is everything changes so uh, I have to remind myself and I do um, remind myself of that so thank you so much for having this wonderful um, way of participation in these talks in these meditations it's you know like you were saying michelle but i think everybody who's shown up here it means so much thank you for your understanding leslie and thank you for making a difference for others it means so much to all of us that your actions your intentional actions in art and all the forms that come from meaningfulness from your heart makes a difference, a huge difference, more than we can imagine. 
Thank you. Well, if there's no more questions, let's take this and make a difference. Take it into our homes, into our lives, our communities. Take care this this week. You know, mm. things are heating up. <laughs> they just keep <laughs> heating up and you gotta be careful of expectation of how you should be versus how you are, how you think you should be, how you are. And if you need to rest more, it's because you're processing more dukkha, more pain, and it's like, it's okay. It's just like, just take um, time to rest enough so that you have courage to be with how things are. That's the, that's the rhythm, and it's um, deep practice. And all the dukkha, it's because you care that it's so hard. Keep remembering it's because you care. Good to see everybody. Great to see everyone. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Mm, so good to see you. Mm. Ah. <laughs>